Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the Gaia Education Glocalizer webinar series. My name is Giovanni Charlo. I am the e-learning coordinator at Gaia Education. And uh, today I have, uh, um, I'm very excited today actually to bring you this webinar entitled Life Creates the Conditions Conducive to Life, Ecological Design at the Heart of Regenerative Cultures with Gaia Education collaborator, Jacqueline Fletcher. Thank you, Jacqueline, for uh, doing the webinar for us today. And uh, I want to just uh, do a little bit of um, housekeeping. This webinar is offered to build capacity in systems thinking and holistic design for sustainability. Uh, during the webinar, we're going to record the webinar and also will be transmitted live uh, on Facebook for those uh, who, are, who are not able to join on the platform. Uh, so the webinar will be available for viewing later on and you're welcome to share it with uh, your social media friends. Also, <clears throat> during the webinar, please close any programs that you don't need so that there is no um, interference with the bandwidth uh, of the webinar. And uh, at the end of uh, Jacqueline's presentation, we'll have a question and answer period. Please use the question and answer box that you see on your uh, application. You can use the chat box to uh, communicate, to put up comments and so on for other participants, but um, the questions that Jacqueline will address will be at the end in the question and answer uh, area of, of the uh, application. Um, I also want to point out other resources that Gaia Education offers. We have a number of publications, for example, that uh, can help you in leading your courses uh, on design for sustainability, whether they be EDE courses um, or uh, shorter courses that you may organize on your own. There are several books to read um, more in-depth articles on the content of our courses. We also have the SDG implementation cards. There's a, a set of flashcards that can be used to have uh, uh, to spark community discussions about the sustainable development goals that Gaia Education also trains on. Uh, along with that goes the um, uh, handbook for multipliers of sustainable development goals that you can also purchase or download a, a free black and white copy from our website. We offer our online courses in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So if you speak one of those languages, you are welcome to come to our website at gaiaeducation.org and uh, look for those courses. We have a whole variety, about 20 different courses being offered at the moment. So you can go through there and see which interests you the most. <clears throat> the, our next course will begin in mid-January, January 14th, 2019, and it will be the ecological design dimension, which uh, Jacqueline and Ezio Gori facilitate uh, together. We also are present in uh, many social media channels, and you're welcome to uh, sign up for uh, our newsletter or to visit us in one of those channels, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Medium, and others. Yes, please come to our website, subscribe to our newsletter to give us permission to communicate with you and give you news about the exciting programs that are going on in Gaia Education. And also, if you want to become a trainer yourself, we have a learning journey uh, path to become a Gaia certified trainer. And uh, in that way, you'll be able to use our pedagogy and our methodologies to run courses on your own. So today we have Jacqueline, uh, Jacqueline Fletcher. Uh, as uh, Jacqueline, as a permaculture and ecological design facilitator with experience in, in various cultures across the world, she has been researching ways to introduce eco-literacy into mainstream cultural narratives and education. Very exciting work, Jacqueline. Jacqueline trains new generations of deep ecologists in the practice of permaculture ethics and principles through a holistic worldview. And she's also co-facilitator of the ecological design dimension at the Gaia Education Online Courses, as I mentioned just earlier. Uh, Jacqueline has collaborated uh, on urban permaculture projects in France, Belgium, Australia, and the Netherlands with scientists, 
economists, and artists, and continues to promote an interdisciplinary approach to all endeavors, and in particular, the role of the arts in design for sustainability. Very exciting, so welcome, Jacqueline. And uh, I will stop sharing my screen so I can turn it over to you and your webinar, Life Creates the Conditions Conducive to Life. Oh, great, so now I have to share my screen, don't I? Yes. <laughs> Except that I don't think I have. Oops, I have to put it in a, a screen mode. Excellent. There we go. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming to listen to the webinar. I hope I can make it interesting for you. Um, Daniel's talk last month was just so good and so inspiring. I do feel that I wanted to carry on from where he left off by taking this quotation from Dr. Janine Benyus from Biomimicry. Life creates the conditions conducive to life. Though um, I do think that Daniel's a very hard act to follow and that I might have bitten off a bit more than I can chew. Anyway, um, I have a lot of slides which will be available afterwards. So if I go through this um, a little bit too hastily, I hope that you'll be able to look at them and get in touch with me later on. I am on Facebook and I'm always happy to have discussions with people about um, ecology and design and the relationship between science and the arts. So um, I want to address this by looking at some of the old narratives and how we transition from those old arid narratives to new regenerative cultures. I think there are some problematic narratives that are left over from the Holocene that are going to be very difficult to work with under the new condi conditions of the Anthropocene. I want to look at how we can make that transition to creating new regenerative uh, narratives. And um, in particular, my interest with the new scientific paradigm, which is holistic, interdisciplinary, and brings the sciences and the humanities uh, together with the arts. I'm going to focus, first of all, on <clears throat> earth system science and look at the way uh, the, 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 the biogeochemical cycles uh, that maintain our planet and maintain all life on our planet are actually driven by life itself and how we can use this knowledge when it comes to designing regenerative cultures. So I hope that isn't too much. And um, I'm gonna start by asking a question, what is nature? Now I think that nature is one of those things that we uh, have to redefine and we have to develop a new understanding for because at present the Oxford English Dictionary definition is the phenomenon of the physical world collectively, including plants, animals, the landscape and other features and products of the earth, as opposed to humans or human creation. So it makes it very clear um, that uh, we're not part of nature, we're separate from it and that nature is more like our environment, that which surrounds us. And I think this is one of the old narratives and I think it is problematical. So how do we go about changing this? Because these old narratives have been around for a very long time. Um, the narratives that we have been living with for several millennia now are narratives of transition. They transition when we transitioned as a species from about 50,000 generations as hunter-gatherers. And our hunter-gatherer ancestors were embedded in nature. That was the only way that they could survive. But when we settled down and we started to cultivate um, crops and when we started to domesticate animals, we moved to a different set of narratives which were much more about control, about uh, dominance, about nature belonging to us. It was created for us. 
And along with that come a lot of ideas about superiority and inferiority, hierarchies, warriors on the one hand and slaves on the other, and a great deal in between. Uh, but also the, um, the, the narratives of gender and gender uh, um, hierarchies. Also, um, narratives about a duality between the spirit and the mind on the one hand, which is a femoral and a it's not a femoral, it's eternal and um, uh, above everything that is in nature that decays. So you get the spirit versus the matter and that type of dualism, which goes on into the Renaissance and into the Enlightenment with the idea that nature itself is dead, that it's mechanical, that rationality and mathematics are the only type of pure spiritual practices. More recently, because that enlightenment um, ideology fed into the industrial revolution and into technology, we've developed uh, a concept of progress so that we have this feeling that uh, everything is progressing along a linear line, things should be getting better and better and better. Um, and we've completely forgotten that up until quite recently, uh, even our agrarian ancestors lived much more with the, the rhythms of nature and a cyclical idea of time. Uh, so, you know, what has happened really is that we have created an ideology of separation. Separation from nature, but separate from each other as well. And it all starts with this, uh, this painting by Gainsborough from the 18th century, which is around about the time when we were developing these new narratives about dominance and control. Um, I call them Mr. and Mrs. Land Grab because what they were doing then is still happening today, though in a slightly different form. And it's all about relationships with the land, ownership, enclosure, dispossession, control. And you can see Mr. Land Grab there with his very faithful dog and his his possessions, his gun, his land, his wife. And there on the land, you actually can't see anything really except a crop. Already the trees are disappearing. Already you can't see any other animals or, uh, or, or foliage. And uh, so this marks a moment when things are really starting to change into the world of modernity. And I really rather like the quote from Dr. Stephen Harding, who is at Schumacher College, uh, when he says, by filling the environment with things it can control, the industrial market economy has lost its grip on logic at roughly the same speed and time as it has emptied its environment of things it can say hello to. And this is, I think, where all of that takes us, the idea that nature is separate, that there is a natural hierarchy, that it belongs to us. Um, it takes us to the place where we are separate and superior and we have a sense of um, ownership, which you see on the left-hand side, the ego side. And the question is, how do we get from that hierarchy um, to the eco side in which we're embedded in uh, the web of life through some new narratives. One of the problems as well with science as, um, as, as the driver of our modern narratives, as uh, Wendell Berry uh, says here, that at the moment our science is at the bidding of corporations and therefore it is not driving uh, a true sense of uh, the reality of the world that we live in because it is mostly at the service of profit. So what we need to have is a new story, a new type of science. Uh, biologist uh, Andreas Weber in his most recent book, The Biology of Wonder, uh, that is a really wonderful book about poetic ecology, as he calls it, about our connectedness about our great love for life and the fact that all life itself uh, is in love with um, life. This, this really must be fundamental to the new stories that we're telling 
um, ourselves. So the beginning of a new story is about questions around the science of life and what it means. Somebody who does permaculture, um, I, I've noticed, um, well, I've always taken it for granted that as James Hutton, one of the 18th century fathers of ge geology says, the earth is not just a machine, but also an organized body as it has regenerative power. So that word regenerative, going right the way back to the 18th century, around the time that Gainsborough was painting uh, this painting of ownership and dominance and control. And the idea was being generated that um, nature is dead and mechanical. So we have two different pathways here. And it's obvious that we went along one path. Um, but all regenerative agricultural systems that have always existed and what we're doing now is in actual fact, we are farming sunlight. That is the bottom line. We're not growing crops, we're farming sunlight. We're allowing plants to transform solar radiation into biogeochemical processes. And in creating edible ecosystems, which is what we do in permaculture, humans are merely helping plants, animals, invertebrates, all living creatures to co-create the cycles that maintain all life on the planet. And this is what is being called these, day, these days ecosystem science. So what we need are the new narratives, the new interdisciplinary sciences, plus the ancient indigenous wisdom um, that shows us that life itself is capable of creating conditions conducive to life if we don't go around destroying it. I sort of came to this trajectory through being at the COP21 in Paris in 2015 and talking to a lot of people from NGOs around um, climate change protest. I also came to it from talking to engineers who are making decisions about what type of technologies we need to use in order to um, mitigate um, climate change. And also, unfortunately, sometimes when talking to people in community gardens or people who want to do permaculture projects and things like that, that there is a fundamental level of eco-literacy that has disappeared from our cultures. That the narratives we tell ourselves no longer are about understanding how nature itself works. And that is one of the fundamental things that we have to uh, realize because otherwise we're going to destroy something that is about maintaining life on this planet. So I come really then to earth system science, poetic ecology, holistic science, environmental humanities, and the art of regeneration. Now there's a quote at the bottom of the slide from Professor Tim Lenton, with whom I did a course um, about five years ago, an eight week course on earth system science. And one of the things that's very apparent is that life on this planet has existed for about 4 billion years and they did very well before we came along. So uh, we weren't necessary to kickstart life on this planet. What Lenton is also saying is that if we are going to study this, we're going to be studying um, something which is interdisciplinary, very deeply interdisciplinary, and which synthesizes elements of geology, biology, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. And I would like to add to that as well, all of the arts and humanities, because uh, basically we need that type of creativity to get the message of the sciences across. And also because artists tend to see the bigger picture much more than scientists who are very focused on their own discipline. So, Earth system science. From this graph here, we can see on the left hand side um, all of the exchanges of gases that take place on planet Earth. And on the right hand side, uh, we see what that would look like if there was no life on this planet. 
These gases are exchanged by all the living creatures that live on this planet as they're just going about their daily business of uh, eating, breathing, reproducing, defecating, just generally being alive. So they are uh, taking part in the process of creating and maintaining what are called the bio-geochemical flows. They're also called cycles, of course. So the cycles are the exchange of gases, the hydrological cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the cycle of nutrients. So I'm going to look very briefly at these uh, one at a time, very briefly. So I hope that you'll be interested enough to go off and study it yourselves. This is the water cycle. And I have here two quotes that come from Dr. Antonio Nobra at the Earth System Science Center in Brazil. Now what he says is that science has become so fragmented. Atmospheric scientists don't look at forests as much as they should. The vegetal climate equilibrium is teetering on the brink. Now a lot of scientists, engineers um, would tell you that uh, forests play a very minor role in, um, in, in, in the hydrological cycle and in climate. But in actual fact, what uh, the Earth System scientists are starting to discover is that trees in general, but the forests like the Amazon, are very, play a very important role in um, mitigating climate change and in determining the, uh, the winds, the trade winds, the amount of water that is recycled. So for example, one large tree in the Amazon can actually recycle a thousand liters of water a day. And if you get 600 uh, billion trees doing that, it's like 600 billion um, geysers that are throwing up uh, water vapor into the air. And while they're doing it, they're also pulling in air off the oceans. So they're circulating water vapor, they're cooling the atmosphere down. And th this is a very important part of uh, maintaining our hydrological cycle, our trade winds, and even our climate. So that in destroying the Amazon, uh, we are actually changing, uh, changing the water cycle in places that you wouldn't expect. Thousands of kilometers away uh, from the Amazon, for example, in California or in the Sahara Desert, you can have droughts that are caused by the uh, deforestation of the Amazon. Uh, even locally, um, it's been discovered that you can have a full hydrological cycle uh, in your own neighborhood, just if you have all of the trees there. The trees will pick up and recycle the water. And if you cut the trees down, you'll have a half hydrological cycle, which means that the, the water uh, runs off into the ocean and the, the land will dry out. Then I want to move on to the carbon cycle. So um, this is a very basic diagram. What you can see is that plants use solar radiation to photosynthesize carbohydrates using carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from the soil. Plants breathe out oxygen. And then secondary consumers, the herbivores and carnivores, will eat the plants and eventually carbon is returned to the atmosphere through defecation or through the death of um, all of these life forms. And it can be stored in the soil or it can be um, sent back into the atmosphere. But the main point I think we have to gather here is that the humble plant is the primary producer on this planet. Without it, there would be no oxygen or food. And then finally, I want to move on to the nitrogen cycle. We need amino acids, which are made from nitrogen for proteins. And nitrogen is made available by plants, to the plants by microbes in the soil. And then they're broken down again by other microbial life forms and returned to the cycle. 
And you can see here that some very interesting things going on there. In the root nodules of some of the plants, you get the nitrogen fixing bacteria, which put nitrogen into the plant. Um, on the other hand as well, you get the decomposers like the bacteria in the soil and the, um, uh, the, the, the mycorrhizal networks, the fungi that also decompose it. And what's very nice about the nitrogen cycle as well is that there are bacteria in there that will denitrify um, the, the process to make sure that it is a complete cycle and that we can actually use this when we're designing as I will come back to later on. Um, talking about uh, microbial life forms that are so important in the carbon and in the nitrogen cycle, I thought it might be worthwhile now having a look at the new tree of life which has been drawn up by uh, scientists working on the Earth Microbiome Project. Uh, this is the new development which, in microbiology, which has been gathering a pace for the last 20 or 30 years. And so that tree of life that we're accustomed to see, you know, with uh, humans at the top of it and all the other animals and insects and birds in the other branches has been completely overturned by this development because almost all of the species in this tree of life are microbial. And where will you find humans? Well, um, rather humbly, uh, we're down in that right-hand bottom corner in that little green branch, the eukaryotes. Um, we're there with all the other animals, uh, the, the, uh, the animals with cells that have nuclei. So we, are, we have been displaced in these terms from that superior position on the tree of life. And we could really say that uh, microbes are now playing a major role in life on this planet. Microbial life is organized and it's absolutely everywhere. So for example, the, the, the human being, 90% of our genetic material is actually microbial. We're only 10% human in that sense, that only 10% of our genetic material is actually homo sapiens. Microbes regulate our immune system, the metabolism, the digestion, and they even play a role in brain chemistry. So these new developments are actually showing that we are really very much embedded in the web of life, even though we might have been telling ourselves narratives of separateness and superiority for very many millennia. Uh, microbial life, of course, also regulates the soil food web. What happens in the soil is all down to the bacteria and the mycorrhizal networks that make nutrients available to plants and also decompose uh, the dead organic matter again. And then we come to fermentation. I mean, what would humans have done all of these millennia without fermentation? We would have had no cheese, no wine, no beer, no fermented vegetables. They've made uh, the, 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 the microbes uh, that are in the process of fermentation have made it possible for us to store food over the winter. And even most recently, uh, cloud seeding bacteria, there is some new evidence to suggest it is possible, though it's not certain, that um, bacteria that are sent up into the atmosphere uh, by rain and by wind and just by the breathing of uh, trees might actually be uh, responsible for creating little crystal, uh, frozen crystals in the clouds so that the, the rain starts to fall again. So microbial life is very deeply embedded in the regulation of all life and the phenomena on this planet. Uh, besides that, we have the mycorrhizal fungi uh, that live underground in our forests and they pass messages and nutrients to uh, trees on behalf of the, the parent trees. These are just a few, um, a few ideas that you can go into ex exploring the, the type of things, <coughs> excuse me, 
that we are dealing with in the ecological dimension because obviously all of this information about all of these wonderful things that life does, uh, they are our tools, they are our co-creators when we come to do ecological design. So to go back to it, life on this planet is genuinely creating the conditions conducive to life. <clears throat> the biosphere is self-organizing and self-regulating and it does this through relationships, networks of connections between the different life forms, between the trees and the insects and the animals and the other plants uh, forms. So we're going back again to this ego and eco thing. So where do we stand now? I think it's really quite clear that we have to let go of the ego bit and we have to actually see ourselves as part of the eco and that we have to help the biosphere in creating these self-organizations instead of regarding it as resources to be used and even worse ecosystem services. So how do we go about designing for regeneration? So we're going to do this by working with the Earth's natural cycles. Um, and once you get to know them, it is so enjoyable just to make all of these discoveries, just to become so passionate about working with nature and to see what nature uh, will do for us if we allow it to. So we have to co-create with other life to regenerate the ecosystems. And we have to position ourselves within this wondrous self-organizing and self-regulating biosphere because life loves being alive. And this has to form the basis for all of the new narratives that we are going to be telling ourselves over the coming years. Let's just look a little bit at the idea of the connections. Now, a tree, once again, to go back to the hydrological cycle and the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, the tree is really fundamental, as is any plant. According to Australian Aborigines, a tree is not just a tree, it's what they called a waru. And a waru is a complementary relationship between organisms. So the tree provides a safe habitat, for other creatures. In return, other creatures carry out the tree's need for pollination, seed dispersal, and nutrients. And um, I think that just about says it all. It doesn't get much better, does it? So we bear all of these things in mind. Uh, the fact that a tree is a whole range of habitats and interconnections and that we need those too. We bear these in mind, we recognize the role played by life when we make our own conceptual budgets for the cycles, such as the hydrological cycle, as is displayed here in this particular slide. Knowing the role that the forests and the trees play is going to change the way we draw up our conceptual budgets. And just look at that, these beautiful heritage varieties of maize doesn't really get more beautiful, does it? And it, you know, industrial monocultures would get rid of all of these um, heritage varieties, all the biodiversity of uh, foodstuffs that people have eaten for millennia and reduce what we eat down to, in the Western world, we eat about 27 varieties or species of uh, a, a vegetable. And a lot of the time we don't eat even that. But then can organic farming feed the world? Well, in fact, it can. 70% uh, of food is grown by small scale farmers, many of them women, I might add, using agroecological methods on just 30% of agricultural land in South America, Africa, and Asia. I sort of always feel obliged to say this because the questions are usually asked circle around things like only industrial agriculture can feed the world, which is obviously not true. So I want to bring that in straight away 
to, to say that, you know, agroecology is about maintaining diversity. It's about maintaining those trees as habitats. It's about maintaining the hydrological cycle, about maintaining the, um, the microorganisms that do so much work in the soil. And, and it's just really beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Let's just have a quick look at um, the soil. Here's another nice quote. Nature does not recognize individuals. In nature, the essential unit is the connection. Resilient is the maximum number of connections between multifunctional and mutually supporting elements. So on the right hand side, I've put a little map of the soil food web, which shows how dead organic matter from the roots is shredded by uh, invertebrates and then it is decomposed by bacteria and by fungi and that everything is eating everything else to keep it in balance. So the birds are eating the invertebrates to make sure that we don't get too many invertebrates that destroy um, the balance in the soil and that we have small soil animals as well. We have earthworms and nematodes and other types of life forms in the soil and that it also always maintains a balance as long as we make sure that there is enough organic matter in the soil, which is also something that industrial agriculture is not doing. On the left-hand side, uh, for the people who are a little bit more into the, the wriggly, squirmy things, uh, this is the, um, the soil food web in a little bit more detail, showing all the different varieties of um, small invertebrates and microbes that you will find there. Fascinating. So, um, As I mentioned earlier, trees are the primary producers. They take solar energy and they turn it into um, chemical processes, the chemical processes that make carbon. And then along come the secondary com consumers. So you have the herbivores and the carnivores, and then there are also more carnivores that eat the carnivores and both and everything, omnivores. And eventually when the, 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 the matter dies, then we need the detritus feeders and the decomposers that turn it all back again into uh, the nutrient cycle. And that's why the connections are so very important. That is why biodiversity is very important when we're designing. We have to tell us these narratives about the richness of nature and that we need all of these uh, creatures, even aphids are necessary because aphids feed ladybirds and hoverflies and things like that. So if we kill them with pesticides, even organic pesticides, we're removing something from the food chain. And that means that we're actually breaking the links, breaking the connections in the food chains. So when we're designing, we're, we're, we're doing this, we're actually creating as many connections between life as possible, creating the conditions under which life will uh, flourish itself. When we're designing, we're working to enable those biogeochemical cycles. And um, it's, it's quite frightening uh, to read in the newspapers these days that we're living through what they call, uh, you know, the six mass extinction and insect um, megadon. And you can see it even here in Europe, I can see it myself in my own lifetime, the decrease in wildlife. 50% of European wildlife loss in 40 years, 75% thereabouts of winged insects in around 27, 30 years, as well as a very serious depletion of soil microbiota, um, which means that we really do have to start doing um, a, a different forms of agriculture and thinking about different ways of living. If we do this, we can have biological pest control. We can design for drought resistance, for example, as you can see at the bottom, that is an original um, design by Bill Mollison from his designer's manual. And on the left, we, we could even design for hurricane resistance, which seems to be a much uh, more problematic occurrence, a much more frequent occurrence in the tropics at the moment. 
So basically what we're asking ourselves to do is to live within the planetary boundaries that enable the geo, um, biogeochemical cycles. If we look at this uh, diagram, which comes from Johan Rockström at the Stockholm Institute for Resilience, we see that there are um, two which are pretty badly compromised, which is the biosphere integrity. And the other one is the biogeochemical flows, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus. And that land system change is up there quite high in the, uh, the yellow-orange zone. So these are really very clearly um, due to uh, agriculture, deforestation, urbanization. And those are the, the areas where we have to focus our attention on creating regenerative systems and placing ourselves at the center of these regenerative systems. So I'm just going to show a few examples of the type of designs that we can do in uh, ecological design and permaculture. These are all from Bill Mollison's original designs from the 1980s. Though there are a lot of really creative people working in the field at the moment. But what we do is we design with the biome. So we have a set of basic principles and basic understanding, but we change, adapt the design uh, to meet the conditions of the local climate, the local soil, uh, the local fauna and fauna. So you can see in the top uh, left hand corner there, that is actually a polyculture aimed for Nigeria. Uh, which would also use trees uh, to maintain the hydrological cycle, but as windbreaks, um, also as uh, a, a way to shade part of the, the crops. So some crops will be in the shade, some crops will be in full sun. In the center, you have a design for an orchard. So you can see that at the top, you see the different types of trees with different canopies, Underneath you see different types of plants that will perform services for the tree. So you'll have nitrogen fixers, you will have pollinate, uh, plants that attract pollinators, uh, plants that attract pest control insects, plants that uh, feed other animals that come in and transform uh, cellulose into uh, soil basically just by eating the grass and uh, excreting the end process and you can also intercrop as you can see around the edges of the trees uh, you can put annual crops in there if you want to but you're creating a, a closed loop polyculture and it's going to include windbreaks forage and habitat biodiversity water retention waste recycling maintaining hydrological carbon nitrogen and other nutrient cycles and I've just added a few more so that you can see how uh, you might need to adapt the way your um, designs fit the landscape. For example, the one at the top is a more hilly landscape. So you're going to need to think about uh, how you retain water. The one at the bottom uh, right hand corner is something I absolutely love because it's a type of forest gardening which is embedded into a natural forest and that is something that actually could be done almost anywhere where uh, woodland is the natural um, the, the natural landscape type. Even in Scotland, as part of rewilding, we could actually build forest gardens into re rewilding projects. On the uh, bottom right hand side, you can see a, a hulku culture, which is combined with a swale. So the swale is about catching water so it doesn't run off. And the hulku culture is actually about uh, making it possible for um, us to store some carbon in the soil that the microbes will then break down and feed the trees that are just behind it. So it's all very exciting, exciting work. Um, I threw that in really just for fun because what you have on the left-hand side is Bill Mollison's design for how an industrial egg is produced. 
So you see that in order to feed a chicken and to keep it housed in a battery, you need all sorts of mining and drilling because you need all sorts of factories and ships to get the fish meal and you need the cereals that are mixed with the fish meal which will be put into pellets to feed the chicken and all of that has to be manufactured and transported and so you need even more industrial processes to build the trains and the lorries and everything and then you get an egg whereas on the right hand side you have permaculture egg which you can see in the top right hand corner uh, requires very little industrial activity, maybe just for the metal for the, the water barrel or for the roof. But uh, most of it is uh, really just feeding the chickens naturally by planting uh, trees and other foliage and attracting insects that will feed them. And in the same time, they are manuring your land. So that's, that, that's really the height of working with nature, isn't it? Um, so to go back to the question, you know, can we feed the world? Well, really, yes, we can. And we can do it in a lot of different ways. We can do it through designing small holdings. And there are two, um, actually three examples here. You have David Holgram's um, project Meliodora, which is really a showcase for um, a small holding, a, a more or less closed loop system. He exchanges some of his surplus with local people. So it is actually on the outskirts of uh, a, a small town, which makes it the type of project which is highly suitable for local community supported agriculture. Um, and the bottom right hand corner, Ben Fork in the United States has a small holding where he has a mixture of uh, animals uh, regenerating the soil because he only has about 10 centimeters of soil above the bedrock. And as you can see as well, he has a very nice system of ponds which are about um, capturing runoff but also about fish. And he also has geese and chickens, which uh, provide eggs and uh, some meat, but they also um, provide pest control. He even grows rice there on the terraces on the hillside in Vermont, which makes it a very, very productive uh, closed system polyculture. And we do this really by uh, drawing up designs before we start. So it's a long process of working with nature to observe and to analyze and to design before we implement it. Which is maybe one of the reasons that so many artists are attracted to permaculture as well, because it's also a very creative process. So on the next slide, I wanted to look at a couple of farms. Yeah, we don't need to do permaculture and ecological diet design on a small scale. We can do it on a much larger scale, though it will always remain polyculture. And to a certain extent, the size will be determined by uh, the needs of the ecosystem itself and uh, allowing um, nature to keep those biogeochemical um, processes going. So on the top right hand corner you have Mark Shepard and his restoration agriculture at New Forest Farm in the United States. Um, he uh, has uh, nut and fruit trees. He took a piece of land which was completely degraded by industrial cereal cropping and he returned it to its natural form basically woodland but what he did with the woodland is he planted fruit and nut trees um, he has perennial vegetables he has some annuals in there and he has also poultry and uh, pigs and a few cows because they also work very closely with um, the the landscape to grow the soil and to sequester carbon and what's really important about these uh, restorative projects is that we can actually sequester a great deal of carbon in the soil providing we do it in such a way that we do not uh, till the soil or dig it which releases the carbon again. In the top right hand corner we have Joel Salatin's Polyface uh, Farm which is also quite um, a remarkable example of what is referred to as holistic grazing. 
so Saladin will, if you ask him what does he farm, he will tell you he farms grass. Um, but that is because he is uh, growing grass which sequesters uh, the soil when the roots die because it has been eaten by the animals. And he has a very good system by which uh, when he's had uh, cattle in a field for a few days and he moves them to the next field, two days later, just at the moment when the, um, the flies have settled on the, the cow pads and the, the eggs of hatched into larvae, he sends the chickens in and the chickens clean up the larvae and they spread the um, they spread the, the manure all over the place so that, that once again th that is fertilizing the soil, enriching it, the grass is growing again and more carbon is being sequestered in the root material. Just below that we have Sepp Holzer the Kramatorhof farm up in Austria. You can see how high up that is. Um, he has such an amazing system there. I couldn't really sum it up. You would need to go to YouTube and look at some of the videos, but he has a whole system in which water is managed to flow down at the hillside in a number of ponds and he has polycultures up there. He has terracing, which really holds the soil in place, which he is building with lots of nitrogen fixes and trees, but he also has his cattle and his pigs um, in various areas on the, uh, the landscape so that it, it remains a very productive polyculture that sequesters carbon. And uh, then below that, this is the farm Pierre Rabi in the Ardèche. I felt it would be a good idea to mention him because uh, in many parts of the world, Pierre Rabi is very famous as an agroecologist. We can do it in suburban and urban food systems. So on the left-hand side, we have a number of uh, projects, a food forest at the top. In between, we have Ecoburbia in Australia. And below that, we have the very magnificent Jettos patch just outside Perth, which is a polyculture back garden to die for. Um, it's just amazing what he gets out of that garden. It's really a food forest. On the right-hand side, um, urban agriculture, Cuba does urban uh, permaculture, polyculture on a very large scale. Uh, Detroit is feeding itself increasingly through urban agriculture. The bottom picture is actually a permaculture garden on the sixth floor of a car park in the middle of Brussels. And I worked with uh, Anne-Marie on uh, building this permaculture project. It was absolutely wonderful. She even has a greenhouse up there. And the, in between, you have um, a garden in Berlin. So let's go on. Uh, we talked about agriculture and growing food, but what about wastewater management? Well, we, you know, we can use all of these microbes to help us uh, cleanse our wastewater, providing, of course, that it's grey water. Uh, we have to do something different with black water. Um, but th the whole process by which in a constructive westland, the carbon and nitrogen cycles play a role using microbes in the roots of the plants to break down the waste products. The biomass that is grown in the wetland can be used. You could use it, for example, in a biogas digester and you can make methane for domestic use. So that's a beautiful closed loop system. That's just the way Mother Nature likes it. And they become, can be absolutely beautiful as well. You can have really large um, uh, wetland systems uh, that work, work like nature, or you can have them indoors too. In, in you know, Northern Europe, like in Findhorn in Northern Scotland, they have what's called a living machine. So you actually have the same processes by which plants are uh, breaking down the, the waste products in the soil, uh, using them to grow the biomass, and also denitrifying uh, the water so that what flows at the other end can actually be used uh, again for irrigation, for example. And what about our houses? Could we look at our houses from the perspective of all of those cycles uh, of nature? 
Well, an unsustainable house would be one in which the, the, all of the products of nature, such as energy, wind, all of the resources and materials, uh, just flow through it and go out the other side as waste products. That's a linear system. If we want to do a closed loop system, then we can uh, use uh, wind, solar power, solar radiation, we can use microbes, uh, we can use plants, we can set up systems by which uh, we are using all that nature offers us before we have to actually think about plugging into the grid or using other forms of technology. I mean, that really is the best way to go about it, thinking about what we can possibly do without access to energy generated from the grid. Here are some examples, passive heating, passive cooling using wind, water, foliage and solar radiation. So we can position our houses to uh, trap heat in summer, but to make sure that the shade, either from an overhang or from trees, and that in winter, where the sun is lower, that it will flow straight through the windows and heat up a biomass wall behind it so that we're getting passive solar energy. We could use this for example as well when we are uh, heating a greenhouse so the, the greenhouse um, will get solar radiation, but if we put it next to the chickens at night when there's no solar radiation, the chickens, of course, are warm and they will be heating the greenhouse during the night for us, which I think is just a wonderful way of doing it. Uh, as far as wind is concerned, uh, this is something I absolutely love. You can design your houses so that the wind passes through them uh, to cool them or to heat them. In the tropics, of course, more often than not, that is about cooling. So you can uh, set up different uh, ventilation points and you can pass air either underneath the shaded area, an area that's shaded by plants so that it goes in to the house and then passes out in uh, different ways through the roof and through um, other areas lower down. You can see that in the top right hand corner, that is the, uh, the house on the lake at Wong San Eco Village in Thailand, where I spent six months in 2016. You can see that the, the, the water is used to draw the air through it. There's actually an opening inside and so the air can uh, come over the lake, it's cool, it comes up, it flows out at the sides and it's even drawn up a staircase to the top and, and flows out that way. So it is cooling the building down. And at the bottom, you can see other ways of doing that. Um, one of them in the bottom left-hand corner is about drawing in air through a pipe, which goes out all the way out to, um, an orchard or some other form of woodland. What about energy? It is possible to create low impact energies uh, that are useful, for example, in countries where there is a lot of, of sunshine, like in, in, in southern Spain or in Portugal, but also increasingly in the third world where there isn't a great deal of money for technology. So, for example, uh, solar cookers or um, solar water pumps, uh, Fresnel lenses, uh, all sorts of uh, very, very simple devices that can trap uh, the uh, trap and magnify solar energy. In the uh, bottom right hand corner, uh, they're growing food in a greenhouse, but they are magnifying the heat of the sun through Fresnel lenses that fall on pipes carrying oil. So the oil is heated to a very high degree, and that is used to heat water for cooking and for washing. Um, on the other side, you have something that but it can, could be used for all sorts of things like solar cooking. Um, 
but it can also be rigged up to a Stirling engine to generate small amounts of electricity. So this is the type of thing that um, ecological designers who go to, um, to uh, tropical countries use quite a lot. So now I'm coming to the end of my talk and I want to bring us back to the idea of whole systems thinking because I've been talking about houses and energy and agriculture and wastewater on what seems like a very small scale which is not really uh, integrated into larger human settlements. But it, you know, if we design our own households we can also design small communities by whole systems thinking and looking at how everything interconnects so that we use one resource for another uh, function and that the waste product of that will then become a resource for another function. And you know, of course, when we look at these things like wetlands and aerobic anaerobic digesters, uh, we're also talking a great deal about the biogeochemical flows that are um, that are part of the microbial life forms. So um, that brings me more or less to the end. If we want to tell a new story, we have to tell a story about how we can do all of these things by working with nature. It is possible. It's an alternative narrative. I think it's a new narrative for the for the Anthropocene, for the 21st century. And it's based really around understanding those cycles that are generated by life itself, of understanding that life loves itself and that we're part of that. So our new regenerative narrative is going to be about taking part in this wonderful, joyful uh, process in which we're actually creating life instead of using it as a resource or even destroying it. If we do this on, um, on a community level, uh, it will also work to regenerate our communities and our societies because it will really mean that we're not going to be uh, drawing on resources from other parts of the world. We can use what we have locally, what we regenerate locally. So th then we come down to the type of things that, um, are stimulated by the ecological model. So, uh, you know, bioregionalism, local economies, community resilience, they, they're part really of the ecological dimension uh, because they are something that uh, comes out of it naturally. If we work with nature, if we love nature, if we love life, then we were going to be automatically regenerating our communities and our bioregions. And so I'm just going to end with my little motto. We come from the earth and we return to the earth and in between we garden. And um, I hope that that was something that will interest you enough that you will go away and look for more information about all of these topics that I have just touched on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Wow, I think we got um, <laughs> a lot to think about. I, I wanna point out that a lot of what you covered um, in your presentation, of course, is, is, is covered in, in a bit more detail in the ecological dimension of design that uh, um, will start next month and uh, <clears throat> that you facilitate along with Ezio. Um, so this is very fascinating to me and a lot, a lot of information <clears throat> everywhere from our personal sustainability to uh, our home and our communities and so on. I want to open now uh, the possibility for participants to pose some questions. Please use the question and answer box that you see at the bottom of your application and Jacqueline will take um, uh, your questions from there and answer them. I guess um, orally and uh, not necessarily written. I don't see any questions at the moment. No, if uh, anybody has any questions, please uh, open the question and answer box and post it there.
well, maybe it was just too much information all in one go. I do tend to get a bit carried away because I feel so passionate about this, that yes. once you embark on this process of understanding how nature works and working with it, it just becomes a lifelong passion. Yes, indeed. Um, Mewish has uh, uh, just a comment. Thank you for an amazing session. Very valuable insights and examples. I'll definitely look for details of the examples you shared. Thank you, Mewish. Yes, thank you. And uh, I don't know if you can see the questions, uh, Jacqueline. I can see the question. Michelle okay. is asking me for three main resources to study. Um, that's an incredibly difficult uh, question to ask. Um, if you're really interested, you could, of course, always uh, join up to do the ecological dimension. Otherwise, I really think that there are There are some very good permaculture books around. It depends in which part of the world you're in. And I don't really know where um, Michel seems like he might be uh, French. Um, if you're French, there are some, Steve Reed has a permaculture book that you can download online. Uh, Pierre Rabhi's books are absolutely wonderful, though he's an agriculturist in general. Um, not really uh, permaculture, but of course there's uh, a lot of overlap. And basically, I would just say start reading about ecology and about life and just watching YouTube videos. There is so much uh, material on um, YouTube that is very interesting. That's a really good place to start. Okay. If I may also mention that um, Gaia Education has published a series of books. Uh, there are four books dealing with sustainability. One of them is focused particularly on the ecological uh, design for sustainability. And it, there are articles that uh, are analytical and critical articles and things like that. They are called the four keys. You can purchase them from our website. Um, and as uh, Jacqueline already mentioned, uh, our ecological design course, which runs for eight weeks, by the way, starts on January 14th. Please come to our website if you are interested in more information. Um, yeah, yes, um, there's a question, do I have any examples from Pakistan? Actually, no, I don't, I'm afraid. Um, but there are a lot of um, permaculture projects in India, which is in the same part of the world. But of course, um, Pakistan probably has a lot of different climates and microclimates, so you would really have to search for something which is appropriate for your own particular climate but certainly try to check out uh, permaculture in India. Mm -hmm. um, Rob, how do we open up farmers um, with a great deal of difficulty? That is um, the answer to that question. I have really tried it and it is uh, really very difficult. Um, I just try to get them uh, it, to show them uh, stuff from Rob Shep um, Shepherd, Mark Shepherd, and uh, what's he called? Sepp Holzer. They're very good examples of what you can do. And they both have very mature farms, particularly Sepp Holzer, because he's been doing this for 40 years, so it's very mature. Also, Jeff Lawton uh, has a lot of videos of uh, around uh, Say Tuna Farm in Australia. And uh, Jeff Lawton is uh, the successor to Bill Mollison. So if you really want to talk to farmers, it's probably better to show him how uh, it works in farming practice. There was a question there from Victoria. It disappeared now, but I see it in the chat anyway. Is there any number of how many people can be supported from permaculture? by a certain area. So, yeah. it, it depends on the area, doesn't it? You know, um, it depends on your bio and it also depends on what you want to eat, um, how much fiber and fuel you need, how much you can exchange with your local 
um, a community. Of course, you know, it, it, it is regenerative. So you could probably get more out of a permaculture plot anywhere than you would get out of uh, an ordinary industrial plot. Graham Bell, who has a, a food forest on the borders of Scotland, has just 0.08 hectares. And he, uh, so what he has, it's food for it. So it's fruit, nuts, massive varieties of different fruit, soft fruit, perennial vegetables and salad vegetables. And he reckons if he had a hect for hectare, he would get 14 tons of food a year from it. Whereas his neighbor on some of the best agricultural land in Scotland, uh, growing mostly cereals, uh, actually only gets, uh, I think, seven tons a year. So, you know, if you work with nature, nature will work with you. But um, it's very difficult to say exactly how much uh, a piece of land would support because land is just so different. Mm. Uh, Claudia provided a couple of uh, resources for uh, Michelle's question earlier. Uh, she says, Patrick Whitefield and Charles Dowding, uh, their books uh, are especially uh, useful. And then she also wanted to know, uh, can you talk a little bit about examples of urban permaculture? Examples of urban permaculture. Um, well, a good one would be the uh, picture that I showed you of uh, Anna Marie May's uh, rooftop garden in the middle of Brussels. Uh, it, it's very productive. When we set it up, uh, it was already producing quite a large amount of uh, fruit and vegetables, even just within a couple of years. It's also very beautiful up there on the top of the car park. Uh, but you can do a lot of different varieties of um, permaculture in very small spaces in your backyard. Um, you can also do it actually on window ledges and balconies. Um, I've got had some really productive balconies uh, over good summers and got kilos of tomatoes and spaghetti squash and courgettes and lots of herbs and salad vegetables and stuff like that. If you do the permaculture way of doing it, you know, through stacking and through multifunctionality, then, you know, you can get quite a lot out of it. But it, it's... I think that urban permaculture, you really need to have people who are very well trained in design. Um, that, that I've met quite a few people who would really like to do permaculture, uh, but are not experienced enough to set up a design yet. So it does actually take a process. And I okay. Yeah, Patrick well, Highfield is dead now, of course, so he's not writing any new books. His videos are, at, are very good. Um, and uh, yes, he did quite a few nice, uh, nice books like How to Create a Forest Garden. Now, personally, if you want a forest garden, I would prefer, I would prefer Graham Bell's book, Permaculture Garden, uh, as a basis, and Martin Crawford's book on uh, agroforestry and forest gardening. And Charles Dowding is very good because he does the no-till thing, but he's not, strictly speaking, a permaculture person because he does use some organic pesticides. Thank you again, Jacqueline. Uh, we've gone for a little bit over an hour, and because this is recorded and um, uh, the idea for people to look at it later that we're not able to make it. However, this was a very rich presentation, and uh, I want to bring it to a close by um, uh, suggesting one more time some of our um, other offers at Gaia Education, if any of you would like to become a certified trainer with Gaia Education, our learning journey will uh, guide you to doing that. We also uh, have this course we mentioned several times starting on January 14th on ecological design facilitated by Jacqueline and Ed Ezio uh, Gori together. Um, there is Ezio who we, he will be giving us a webinar next month on December 12th. So I encourage you all to also join that webinar a little bit more about ecological design and uh, practical applications. 
Our SDG, Sustainable Development Gold Cards, are available for purchase and download at our website. And also a guide, a multiplier's handbook for how to implement conversations on the community level using the SDGs. We have many publications. I mentioned some of this in uh, uh, Michelle's question. There is Eco Villages around the world. I have excellent examples of how permaculture has been applied uh, in various different kinds of designs, in many different sizes as well, urban and rural. And the four key books that uh, you see there also posted uh, have very interesting articles, analysis and criticism of um, ecological design. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter to receive more information about what's going on with Gaia Education, our courses, our programs, and uh, our stories about our students as well. And follow us on our social media um, network. So thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you, Jacqueline, for making the time and the presentation. It was really fascinating.